Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Grand Rounds. This is the first Grand Rounds of the 21-22 uh, academic year. Uh, so welcome back, although most of us haven't gone to many places because uh, the COVID pandemic is still with us. Um, let me just say a few words about that and a couple of other things by way of updating people and uh, then introduce our speaker for today. Um, so in, we got into the COVID uh, pandemic beginning in March of 2020 and it surged, then waxed and waned, and then the vaccines were rolled out and we thought the Calvary had arrived and things were going to, uh, you know, linearly uh, decline and, uh, and, and improve and uh, be extinguished. And uh, the nadir probably occurred sometime in June, late June, early July. But then as a result of the large proportion of people that are still unvaccinated, the Delta variant, uh, the infection rate has increased now and nothing like the, during the surge in the spring of 2020, but it's been going up uh, slightly daily. And that's something that's not just New York, it's across the country. Um, the models predict that this new upsurge is going to peak sometime in October um, and it'll plateau then, not decline, but then there'll likely be surges again, peaks again in the holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And the realistic projection is, is that uh, things won't be on the decline and you know, on a path towards what could be normalization until the spring of 2022. So we're gonna be living with this for a while longer. Uh, what that means is that the same restrictions in terms of infection control with masks, social distancing, um, uh, telemedicine or telecommuting are gonna stay in place pending guidance from our sponsoring institutions. The other thing is that uh, a third administration of the vaccine is being recommended. And although specific um, uh, locations and designations of groups to receive it haven't been uh, communicated, uh, they will be uh, within the next couple of weeks. So everybody should be looking towards that third administration. Uh, and we'll say more about that in a town hall meeting uh, a little later in September. Um, so uh, the pandemic is going to continue for now. Um, let me also uh, welcome uh, people who have arrived over the summer, uh, particularly our new trainees, the residents, the students, uh, the fellows, et cetera. Um, and also just mention, although I'm not gonna go into uh, a detailed uh, um, enumeration, uh, while the pandemic's been ongoing and as part of the strategic plan, we have engaged in a number of recruitments of new faculty, uh, which we've been largely successful in. And uh, some have arrived, some will be arriving. Uh, announcements will go out about those, but let's just say that's to say there's going to be sort of new faces, new names, new blood uh, to infuse our already rich uh, uh, faculty. Um, also, let me mention that uh, the Grand Rounds format um, has undergone a planned transformation. So previously, Jonathan Posner was the coordinator, and he and I handled most of the uh, duties and ceremonies. You know, managing the schedule, coordinating the logistics, uh, introducing and moderating. Um, uh, we're uh, going to, since Jonathan has left for Duke, uh, we've decided to uh, charge three of our really talented younger faculty uh, to take over that responsibility. Uh, Christine Denny, uh, Jeffrey Miller, and Kate Elkington. And so um, they'll be holding forth uh, for the grand rounds uh, in the uh, in future occasions. Um, also, to the extent that people want to make comments, uh, whether it's recommending speakers or anything else, um, uh, there would be the people to communicate with and they'll be sending out a more general announcement of how uh, faculty can provide input to them uh, for uh, grand round speakers and, and considerations. So, um, I'm glad that uh, they'll be assuming this responsibility. Um, and I'll just be relegated to uh, interrupting the speaker and asking questions periodically. Um, well, today is really uh, not just a special occasion because it's the first of the year, 
uh, but also because we have somebody speaking to us who's really an iconic figure in academic psychiatry and somebody I've known for a really long time and hold near and dear as a friend and colleague, that's uh, Dilip Jest. Um, Dilip hails from, let me see, I've got to get this right, um, from India, Pune, India. He was educated there, uh, and then he came to uh, the United States where he did a series of postgraduate training in psychiatry and intern in medicine um, at Cornell, at um, uh, New Jersey College of Medicine and Dentistry, um, and then went to the NIMH where he joined the um, neuropsychiatry branch that was directed at the time by the late uh, Richard Wyatt. Um, and this was a time in the late 70s, early 80s, that psychiatry was going through a transformation. And uh, Dick Wyatt was sort of in the forefront of this in terms of uh, trying to weave neuroscience into clinical psychiatry. And apart from engaging in traditional modes of research, uh, focusing largely on schizophrenia, but uh, uh, other related serious mental illnesses, he instructed his fellows, which included Dillip, Danny Weinberger, Joel Kleinman, people like that, to do a neurology residency. So he dispatched them to George Washington where they had to complete a whole residency while they were doing their research. Um, so uh, that's to say that Dillip is a board certified psychiatrist, board certified neurologist, also a geriatric psychiatrist. Um, but in 1980, when did you move to UCSD, 82 or 84? 86, 86. 1986, he was recruited to the promised land. And um, this is before they started uh, uh, expelling their governors. Well, I guess we've done it too, so um, uh, to UCSD. And um, he's had a phenomenally productive career there uh, in terms of not just being prolific in the area of geriatric psychiatry and schizophrenia research, but also in terms of his leadership in academic and professional positions. So currently he holds the position of Senior Associate Dean for Healthy Aging and Senior Care. He's the Estelle and Edgar Levy uh, Acting or Chair on Aging, Director of the Sam and Rose Stein for Institute uh, on Aging, Distinguished Professor of Neurology and Psychiatry and Neuroscience at UCSD and Co-Director of the UCSD IBM Center on Artificial Intelligence for Healthy Living. So um, he was also past president of a professional associations, including the APA, the American Association for Geriatric Psychiatry, and uh, the founding president of the International College of Geriatric Psychoneuropharmacology. He's also been elected to the National Academy of Medicine and is the past editor of the American Journal of Psychiatry. So. Enough said, uh, Dillip is uh, a man of consequence and uh, credentials and uh, is worth listening to. And to boot, he wrote a book for the lay public that came out last year uh, about wisdom as one of the benefits of aging. Uh, so pleased to have him with us today, albeit virtually. It's glad to see you again, Dillip, and uh, I'll turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for inviting me here and uh, for such a kind introduction. And even more importantly, for being a close friend for uh, over 30 years. Um, I say that one of the privileges of being in psychiatry is being a friend of Jeff. Um, Jeff really has been a visionary leader in our field, brilliant scientist uh, and I worked with him in several capacities. Um, among them, for example, when he was leading the KT study, the largest study of this kind funded by NIH, uh, and did an amazing job uh, really in that study. Similarly, he also has written multiple books, including Shrinks, uh, which became quite popular. And I just understand that he's writing a new book on biography of schizophrenia. Uh, so thank you for everything, Jeff. Uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor uh, talking at Columbia. I mean, I have so many good friends at Columbia, really, that it, it feels like almost coming back home. Um, so thank you. Okay, 
So I'm going to talk on wisdom. Let me share screen. And can can everybody see the slides yep we can see them thank you thank you so i'm going to talk on loneliness and social isolation versus wisdom and compassion from biology to intervention so first of all in terms of disclosure potential conflicts of interest i have no financial relationship with the pharmaceutical industry However, I do get royalty from books like Wiser that uh, Jeff mentioned uh, and positive psychiatry. So I'm going to start with uh, what is loneliness and what is social isolation. Next, I want to talk about wisdom and its relevance to aging and possibly evolution. Next, I will discuss neurobiology of wisdom and finally, can we really become wiser? So starting with loneliness, according to a British historian, Faye Alberti, the word loneliness did not exist in English language until 1800. The word that existed was oneliness and oneliness just meant being by oneself. It did not have any negative connotation. So you can be by yourself and be happy, be creative, enjoy what you're doing. However, that L got added around 1800. And it is not just addition of a letter. It changed the approach or perspective about being alone. Loneliness, is associated with distress. And as I will talk about this in the next few slides, uh, it has really bad health consequences. So what happened around 1800 that changed things from loneliness to loneliness? Alberti's hypothesis that it is related to beginning of industrialization. Till then, it was largely agricultural society and then once the industrialization started it had a lot of social influences families became smaller the divorce rates increased increasing competition increasing mobility and as i will talk a little later this problem has become far worse in the last 20 years So we use loneliness and social isolation as if they are synonymous. They are not. They are related, but not same. Loneliness is subjective. It is a subjective distress, distress that you feel by a feeling of being alone. So it is perceived isolation. Whereas social isolation is objective. It means that you don't have enough friend or you don't have good quality friends. So that is objective isolation. And this is important distinction because although social isolation increases loneliness, loneliness can occur without social isolation. Think about the college students, the undergraduates. They live in dorms. They're surrounded by hundreds of students. On social media, like Facebook, they have thousands of followers or friends. And yet, they are among the loneliest group of people. So loneliness is subjective, social isolation is objective. So why should we worry about loneliness and social isolation? Because they, are called, they have been called silent killers. Uh, the Surgeon General uh, Vivek Murthy published a book on loneliness recently. And Julian holt Lundstad. Uh, an epidemiologist at uh, BYU, Brigham Young University. She has done some great meta-analysis of the effects of loneliness and social isolation and shown that 
loneliness increases the odds of mortality by 30%. It is as dangerous to health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day and more dangerous than mild to moderate obesity. And look at the statistics. This is from the US government's Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. They said that in the US, 162,000 deaths per year are attributable to loneliness. This is more than the number secondary to lung cancer or stroke. So what happens is that loneliness increases the risk of number of diseases, including heart disease, diabetes, obesity, dementia, as well as major depression, generalized anxiety disorders, and various other conditions. And it's not just a health problem. It is also a societal problem that affects businesses and government too. In the UK, a new minister of loneliness was appointed by then Prime Minister Theresa May in 2018. And the reason was that the businesses found that they were losing billions of pounds because of loneliness among the workers. Loneliness is associated and clearly contributes in a major way to suicides and opioid use. The number of suicides in the US has increased by 33% from 1999 through 2017, both in men and women. And that number has especially gone up during the last year of COVID. So I'm talking actually about, so these data, these are pre-COVID data. Still, the suicides were rising for 20 years. Opioid abuse, opioid use related deaths. In 1999, there were 8,000 Americans who died from opioid use. In 2017, that number had increased to about 50,000. And last year, it was 100,000. So just think about that, that more than tenfold increase in the number of deaths from opioid use in the last 20 years, including the period before COVID. So there is something happening that has led to, that led to drop in average lifespan. I mean, obviously last year, the lifespan will go down considerably because of COVID, but before then, lifespan, average lifespan dropped in 2015, 16, 17, because of suicides, opioid, opioid use related deaths. So what is loneliness? So loneliness is a personality trait. I mean, in a way it is both a state and a trait um, because the level of loneliness does vary in a person. However, there are people who are more likely to be lonely than others. And there's a large GWA study of loneliness in the US, uh, in the UK. Um, it included nearly half a million people. And they found that loneliness is modestly heritable. I think that's true for most of the personality traits. They are modestly heritable, about 37 to 55%. And it has a highly polygenic architecture. The noteworthy thing is that the genes that predispose to loneliness are so predisposed to cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, and psychiatric disorders, including major depression and dementia. And that's one of the reasons why loneliness is so dangerous to health. So part of the association is genetic. And of course, part of it is behavioral. If you're lonely, you're not going to go out. You're going to be more sedentary, more likely to be obese, smoking, using substances, and so on. The good news. The rest, much of the rest of my talk is going to be on this good news, which is that wisdom may be an antidote or a vaccine against loneliness. And I will talk about various studies that we have been doing a little later, but this is just one study I wanted to show you. Uh, this was a study that uh, we did using Amazon MTurk, uh, Mechanical Turk uh, system. We had nearly 3000 people across the adult lifespan. And on the X axis, you see the wisdom scale and Y axis is the loneliness scale. The correlation was negative 0.51, highly significant. So people who score high on wisdom are not lonely and vice versa. 
And I, I want to talk about that in more detail as we go ahead. So, so that was the thing about loneliness and social isolation. They are serious, common, and associated with worse health. So switching to wisdom now. So as we all know, wisdom has been a religious and philosophical construct for centuries. Every religion and every philosophy practically has wisdom in it. This is Sophia, the Greek goddess of wisdom. And uh, you may have heard this, but there are more goddesses of wisdom in different religions than gods of wisdom. So it looks like there is a sex difference even in the heavens. But wisdom as a scientific construct has been a very recent thing. And that's because scientists, especially the hardcore scientists, including neuroscientists, don't like fuzzy constructs, which are, example is consciousness. For centuries, scientists really didn't pay attention to consciousness. They said consciousness is a philosophical and psychological construct, it's not bi biological. And today we know actually so much about neurobiology of consciousness, right? Emotion, cognition, again, they were dismissed as purely psychological phenomena. Stress. Even today, we cannot define stress. There is no good definition of stress. There is no good marker of stress. There's no single biomarker that assesses stress, right? And yet, nobody questions that stress has major biological influence. It affects almost every disease, it can worsen that. Uh, and another example is resilience. Uh, resilience, again, was dismissed as a psychological construct. But in the last 20 years, remarkable research has shown that, has shown that there is molecular bi biology of resilience that is known. There are animal models of resilience. And so I submit that wisdom belongs in the same category. It's a fuzzy construct, um, harder to define, and yet, it is real, I think. It is biologically best, and that's what I want to spend time on. The good news is that empirical research has been increasing in this field. There was no empirical research on wisdom until about 1975 uh, at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin and University of Southern California in Los Angeles. The first papers on wisdom were published, empirical research. And the numbers of publications has been increasing. In the last decade, there were 2,000 papers in PubMed that had wisdom as a keyword. And yet most of this research has been done and is being done by gerontologists, sociologists, non-biological psychologists. Very few neuroscientists and physicians have done research on wisdom. There are, of course, there are exceptions like um, uh, at Harvard, uh, the aging study uh, and uh, so on, but those are exceptions rather than rules. So when we started thinking about doing research on wisdom, the first thing you had to do for research on any subject is to define it, right? So how do you define wisdom? So you look at the literature and the literature on wisdom started in antiquities, scriptures. Almost every religion scriptures, I think, mention wisdom. So what we did was we started with looking at Indian scripture because that is something I was familiar with, the Gita. It is supposed to be a guide to wisdom in everyday life. And of course, it's a religious book also. So we did a mixed methods, qualitative, quantitative study with a medical anthropologist as a consultant. And we published a paper on how wisdom was defined in the Gita. Then we looked at the definition of wisdom in the modern empirical literature, modern Western literature. Uh, as I said, there have been a number of papers, some of them, not everyone of them, but some of them have 
try to define wisdom. So we wanted to find out what were the common elements of wisdom in this definition. Uh, we also established an international expert consensus using a Delphi or RAND panel method. So we are doing, looking at wisdom in three different ways. And I thought that we are going to get very different definitions because most of us think about wisdom as a social cultural concept, it would change. We are surprised, almost stunned to find that the conceptualization of wisdom was very similar from ancient times to today. There were some, there are clearly some differences, but these are minor differences. No major differences in the conceptualization of wisdom. And what is that conceptualization? Wisdom is a personality trait. It's a trait like resilience, neuroticism, extroversion, introversion. But it has multiple components. And what are the components? The most important component is pro-social behaviors. This is empathy and compassion. The thing that we do for other people than selfishly for ourselves. Empathy means understanding or sharing somebody's emotions or thoughts. Compassion means acting on it and helping someone else. Then comes emotional regulation. Think about a teenager, his emotions fluctuate from hour to hour and minute to minute. And then think about an older person who is pretty calm, controlled, his emotions don't go from one extreme to another, so that is emotional regulation. Next is self-reflection. It is ability to look in words, try to understand our own behavior. When something goes wrong, the knee-jerk reaction is to blame somebody else or something else. Instead of that, thinking that maybe I did something wrong, what can I learn about myself from that? Then comes something which is sadly lacking today, which is accepting uncertainty and diversity of perspectives. You know, today's world, we have become so polarized. <clears throat> People watch their specific favorite TV channels and not others. They read only favorite, their favorite papers and not others. And that's not a part of wisdom. You can have strong value systems, but you can accept the fact that others may have different systems and you can respect their right to have that. And at the same time, one needs to be decisive. You can't be sitting on the fence saying that you don't know if this is right, that is right. You have to be decisive when called for. And finally, spirituality. This is the most controversial component of wisdom. It is not accepted by all. Uh, but spirituality is different from religiosity. An atheist can be spiritual. Spirituality means feeling connected to something or someone that you don't see, hear, or feel. And people call it spirit, they can call it soul, consciousness, or God. Doesn't matter what it's called, but it's just a feeling of constant connectedness. So that's the important thing. So, so these are the common components of wisdom in the modern Western definition as well as in the scriptures. The next question is: how do you measure wisdom? You know, for most personality traits, there are scales. There are scales for measuring resilience, optimism, introversion, right? So we developed a scale called San Diego Wisdom Scale. Um, so like other personality scale, there are items that describe behavior. And you have to say to what extent you agree or disagree with those statements. For example, our scale includes items like, it is important that I understand the reasons for my actions. So you're looking at self-reflection. Another is I have trouble thinking clearly when I'm upset. This is opposite of emotional regulation. It means that when I become very emotional, I stop thinking logically. So there are some positively worded items, some negatively worded items, but based on that, you get scores for each component of wisdom as well as the total scale. So go, talking about aging now. So I come from India, as Jeff said, and in most Eastern cultures, it is believed that older people are wiser, they're respected. And I wondered after I became interested in neuroscience, whether 
this actually is a proven fact or can, can we actually test this hypothesis? So we looked at the literature and there have been a number of studies published that show that older people do better than younger ones on emotional regulation, positivity, that is favoring positive emotions and memory, empathy and compassion, that is pro-social behavior, self-reflection, and decision-making decisions that require experience because experience comes with age. And these are all components of wisdom. Now, the caveat here is that these are cross-sectional studies. So they don't really prove causality. But we just completed a longitudinal study and this is probably the first longitudinal study of its kind for wisdom. Um, we find that wisdom does seem to increase up to a certain age in later life. And then, of course, as the cognitive impairment takes over, it, it drops. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist, as Jeff said. And as a geriatric psychiatrist, I often have wondered, how come people live so long, humans? Because that is not consistent with Darwin's hypothesis of survival of the fittest. So according to Darwin's hypothesis, animals live vertebrately only so long that they can reproduce, right? Because each species, there are deaths and the dead animals need to be replaced by babies. So you are useful to the species only so long as you can produce children. And that is true for most vertebrates. That's not true for humans. We have menopause in women or andropause in men around age 45 to 50. Today, the average lifespan is 82 in the US. It will soon be 90. So if somebody lives to age 90, right, they have spent half of their lifetime without fertility, without producing children, without contributing to species survival. Why does the nature let that happen? That doesn't make sense unless something happens that compensates for this loss of fertility with age. And that brings us to, I don't know if you can read this, but uh, it is grandmother hypothesis of wisdom. And what is grandmother hypothesis? So what you see is at the top, there is a couple. So they are the grandparents. And of course the, and mother is more important than grandfather. Then the middle figure, so that's an adult daughter. When the grandma helps this adult daughter raise children, then the adult daughter actually has more time for other things. She can have a better life, more enjoyable life, and she produces more children. So if the grandma is involved in helping her adult daughter raise children, the adult daughter has a better life, she's happier, lives longer, and is more fertile than her mom. So although the grandma can reproduce, she's helping her daughter produce more children. So that's the theory thinking behind that. And mind you, these are studies done in bottlenose dolphins, orca or killer whales, a species of birds called Sigillus warblers. And these are papers published in Nature and Science. So this is really hardcore science that shows that grandparents actually have influence on fertility in the younger generation. Uh, some of my colleagues published a paper in PNS um, a few years ago, showing the presence of what are called grandparent genes. These are variants of CD33 and APOE that are associated with better functioning heart and brain. So if you have these variants, you will live longer and you'll be able to grandparent. But here I've been talking about fertility. But grandparents actually do much more than that. Grandparents are necessary for transmission of social cognition and cultural values like cooperation to grandchildren. You know, think about that. Humans have the longest childhood and longest post-fertility period, childhood. Our brain keeps on growing till early 20s. 
and yet we produce children when we have puberty. So a 14 year old girl can have a child, right? But her brain hasn't stopped growing and won't stop till about 2021. So, so here is somebody who is barely mature enough to take care of herself or himself and yet produces child. How can the child be taken care of? So that's where the grandparents become so critical for not only for the daughter, but also for the grandchildren. So grandparents are important for transmitting cultural values and social cognition. So that's where actually transmission of wisdom in a way comes into play. There are studies that have shown uh, the value of grandparents. This was a study in UK, uh, 1500 secondary school students. Um, they found that when grandparents were involved in raising the kids and those kids grew up, they had fewer emotional problems, more pro-social behaviors and fewer adjustment difficulties compared to those in whose upbringing grandparents were not involved. And this was especially true among teenagers from single parent and step parent families. There's another study, well-known study called Experience Core. A study funded by MacArthur Foundation about 20 years ago, done mainly at Hopkins. What they did was they took some older people over age 65 who had retired from their jobs and then randomly divided them into two groups. And one group was asked to spend at least 15 hours a week in a public elementary school. Okay, so these older people, they had to go to these public elementary schools. Uh, and these are kids who didn't have grandparents and sometimes not even functioning parents. So they had to help this kid. After one year, these kids, of course, did very well. Their grades went through the roof, they were very happy. But importantly, the older people themselves benefited from this. Their biomarkers of stress and aging in blood and urine improved, and the volume of hippocampus on brain MRI was larger in these volunteers at the end of the year compared to the controls who did not. Now, that doesn't mean the volume of hippocampus increased. No, it didn't. What it means is it did not shrink in this volunteer compared to those who did not volunteer. So, that brings us to the neurobiology of wisdom. How can that happen? So one of the things I said was that we found that wisdom construct seem to be similar across centuries, across geographic regions. What does it mean that the basic construct of wisdom has not changed? To me, it meant that it must be biologically best because if it is biologically best, it won't change dramatically, right? Um, and of course, biologically best, where would it be? Of course, in the brain and where in the brain? So how do you find neurobiology of wisdom? I started with a literature search using the search term neurobiology and wisdom. Didn't find a single article because most neuroscientists don't use the word wisdom. So I had to look at the components of wisdom and their neurobiology, like neurobiology of empathy, compassion, or its opposite, antisocial personality. And I found that there were lots and lots of articles, lots of brain imaging studies, uh, neurochemical, neuropathological studies um, of related to these components of wisdom, like uh, empathy, compassion, emotional regulation, and so on. And we found that similar regions were involved in different components, mostly the prefrontal cortex and limbic striatum. But then the question was, here we are talking about neurobiology of components of wisdom, not wisdom as a whole. How do you do that? So we decided to study what I call experiments of nature. People who were wise to start with, then something happened to their brain, injury or disease, and they became unwise. Where was the damage? Again, looking at the literature, the difficulty was that nobody had used the word wisdom. So we had to look at the descriptions to find out if they would meet the criteria for wisdom. Uh, I think the one example, and I think probably most people in the audience know about this, I don't need to go into detail, Phineas Gage. Uh, 
probably the most famous person probably in the history of neuroscience. Um, he was a young uh, construction worker in Vermont uh, in the mid 19th century. Um, he was a wise man, good man, smart person, uh, but there's a huge explosion, iron rod went through his brain uh, and he became totally unwise according to the description given by his physician. About 20 years ago, a study was done of his skull uh, by Dr. Damasio at, uh, he was at UCLA at that time, using computer technology and looking at sort of the, the projection of where would the damage go. And they found that the predominant damage was prefrontal cortex bilaterally. And there have been about a dozen such cases reported since then. There is a disease called frontotemporal dementia. The behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia, the symptoms are exact antithesis of wisdom. And as the name suggests, the damage is to the front part of the brain. So looking at all this literature, we published this paper on neurobiology of wisdom in Archives of General Psychiatry. And we found that the two main regions that are involved in different components of wisdom as well as overall wisdom are prefrontal cortex and limbic striatum. And prefrontal cortex specific regions, namely vent ventromedial, dorsolateral, uh, and anterior cingulate. Uh, insula is also important. And then striatum, ventral striatum, and amygdala. So the interesting thing is the prefrontal cortex is the newest part of the brain in evolution whereas amygdala is the oldest part of the brain in evolution. So in a way, the wisdom shows the balance between the two. So I talked about how wisdom may increase with aging. How is that possible when the only thing that we think aging does is degeneration of the brain? Well, a number of studies have shown that older people who stay active, and that word is really important, active, active physically, cognitively, socially. There are phenomena called posterior and anterior shift of aging and hemispheric asymmetry reduction. There is loss of lateralization that results in greater recruitment and more efficient utilization of neuronal mm -hmm. network. Uh, new synapses can form and even new neurons in specific regions of the brain like dented gyrus of the hippocampus or periventricular area. This has been shown in multiple animal species. Uh, Rusty Gage and a number of other scientists have shown that. Uh, and then brain imaging studies have shown that amygdala becomes less responsive to negative emotions. If negative emotions like anger, regret, fear, sadness, compared to younger people. But the amygdala activation with positive stimuli or images doesn't change. And that may explain why there is greater emotional regulation and positivity with uh, aging. Of course, the caveat is that this will continue at, until a certain point in life when the cognitive decline overwhelms the brain structure and function. And but that, can, that happens at different ages in different people. It could happen as early as 70 or may not happen till 95. Okay, so, so I showed you the slide about loneliness and wisdom going in the opposite direction. And we have, I don't, I want to go quickly over this to make sure that there's enough time for question and answer. In general, as I said, loneliness is clearly associated with physical and mental health. And number of studies have shown that wisdom and compassion are associated with better physical and mental health. Uh, qualitative studies confirm that. Uh, I showed you a slide where there was strong inverse correlation between loneliness and wisdom. And we have replicated that finding in three other studies, including people from Italy. And recently we completed a longitudinal study, um, this paper coming out in translation of psychiatry, um, where we followed people for seven years. And we found that people who scored higher on wisdom and compassion at baseline had much less loneliness and greater well-being seven years later. And the neurobiology of these two, again, loneliness neurobiology also includes prefrontal cortex uh, and limbic striatum. Not exactly the same regions, but a lot of overlap. And this is uh, 
especially exciting is that this association is not merely clinical, it is also biological. Uh, we just a few months ago published an EEG study, um, 150, nearly 150 adults across the adult lifespan. We found that uh, the temporoparietal junction was affected differently in lonely versus wise people. Loneliness was associated with increased activity in the presence of angry emotions, whereas wisdom was associated with greater activity in the presence of happy emotions, same region, temporal junction, but opposite kind of emotion affected its activity. And even more interesting is the finding with the microbiome, cut microbiome. In general, the more diverse the microbiome composition, that is the more variation you have in terms of species and taxa of the microorganisms you have in the gut, the better it is. Greater diversity is good for health. So what we found here was that greater diversity was associated with greater wisdom, whereas loneliness was associated with less diversity. So it looks like there is even biological support for loneliness and wisdom going in the opposite direction. Just my last slide before I move to the last section of uh, my talk. The last year was a terrible year for older people, right? COVID, um, older people um, are at the highest risk of serious physical complication, highest risk of getting hospitalized, going into ICU, needing ventilator and dying, right? So the geriatric psychiatrist, I mean, we all in geriatric psychiatry were very worried that we are going to get a plethora of problems with depression, anxiety, loneliness in older people. And also older people don't use technology like the younger ones too. So when the social isolation because of um, um, the requirements to prevent spread of the virus would have been worse for older people. What do we, what people have found was the exact opposite. Uh, Publicist this comment in JAMA, but overall the study showed there is lower prevalence of psychopathology and greater resilience, compassion and wisdom in older people than in younger ones. Study by Laura Carstensen at Stanford. She found that aging was associated with higher level of positive emotions like happiness and lower level of negative emotions like depression. And then this was a study of more than 5,000 adults publishing JAMA network open. They found that the prevalence of psychopathology, and by that I mean prevalence of depression, anxiety, and perceived stress. The prevalence was about 15% in people over 65 compared to 75% in young adults between 18 and 24. Again, younger people had every reason not to have depression and anxiety, physically healthiest, use technology so they could connect socially. And yet older people did better. Why? Very likely because of their increased higher level of wisdom and compassion. So this is all fine, but can really be enhanced wisdom. And I think the answer is yes, because Wisdom, as I said, is a personality trait. And most traits are partially inherited, about 50%, just like as I showed you about loneliness, which means that 50% of the trait is affected by environment and behavior. And even the 50% uh, that is inherited, again, gene expression is affected by environment and behavior. Uh, so wisdom is modifiable. Let me just skip this. But is there evidence for that? We published a meta-analysis in JAMA Psychiatry last year. We found 57 randomized control trials that sought to enhance a component of wisdom. Again, mind you, none of these studies use the word wisdom, but they reported RCTs to improve empathy, compassion, and altruism, to improve emotional regulation, or to improve spirituality. And all these three are components of wisdom. 
These are studies done in people with mental illnesses, physical illnesses, and those from the general population. And by the way, most of these studies included psychosocial or behavioral intervention. Intervention with uh, principles of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, meditation, mindfulness, and so on. Nearly half of the study reported significant enhancement of the specific wisdom component that they were studying with moderate to large effect sizes. So this means that it is possible to improve these components of wisdom with psychosocial behavioral intervention, not in everybody. And again, like all studies, they have limitations. We don't know how long improvement will last, so on and so forth. But it clearly shows that these are modifiable traits. I want to just give you one example of how such an intervention can have societal impact. This is a study done in Spain, 176 adolescents. The intervention involved what they call cyber program 2.0. The goal was to prevent bullying and cyber bullying, which we know is a major problem for younger people today. People have committed suicide because of cyber bullying. What they did was this was a group therapy, 19 sessions, each for one hour. And they included role-playing, brainstorming, case study, guided discussions. The researchers found that compared to the control group, the cyber program 2.0 increased empathy and reduced the amount of bullying and cyber bullying. Again, one study doesn't prove anything, but it shows that the type of things we need to do as a society to prevent things like cyberbullying and bullying. So as Jeff said, uh, I published this book called Wiser and that talks about how you measure wisdom as well as how you increase the wisdom. Uh, and these are again, evidence-based uh, strategies. Uh, many of them based on randomized controlled trials done separately. So there have been specific strategies for increasing compassion. And by the way, when you talk about compassion, it is not just compassion toward other people. You also have to be compassionate toward yourself. You know, we often find that people who are often compassionate toward others tend to be very harsh on themselves. They don't forgive themselves and that's not a good idea. So the strategies for compassion include keeping a gratitude journal, write a couple of things before you go to bed that make you feel grateful. Volunteering, volunteering activity to help people with disabilities, for example. Um, sense of common humanity. When something goes wrong, we blame ourselves or blame the person who made the mistake. And yet we should probably think that everybody makes mistakes, it is common humanity, and everybody faces major challenges. Self-kindness. We comfort our friends when they are in trouble. So same way we need to comfort ourselves when we are in trouble. And lastly, mindfulness. When we are stressed out, we realize that we have been stressed out in the past and we have come out of this. And think about COVID. I mean, at the height of COVID, a little more than a year ago, it looked so bleak. There's no idea where we are going to go. And, you know, while things are not back to normal, it's amazing that with vaccination, we should have developed so rapidly uh, that it has been largely brought under control. So, so where would the research go on wisdom in future? So I'm hoping actually that more and more people will accept the concept of wisdom, especially on the neuroscience side, because it has personal as well as societal value. I think one thing that is needed are longitudinal studies, including genomics. Um, there are lots of genomic studies going on right now. Unfortunately, they don't use validated scales to measure wisdom. Uh, again, we need to do more studies on neurocircuitry using functional imaging. Animal studies. Wisdom overall is a uniquely human trait. However, components of wisdom are definitely seen in lower animals. Uh, we know of dogs and cats who can be very compassionate. Uh, that's true for elephants and so many other animals, right? Um, so there are components of wisdom that exist in lower animals too. Uh, biological effects of behavioral interventions. 
Uh, that's what, for example, meditation, mindfulness clearly impact uh, white matter integrity, sometimes even the volume of the gray matter. And then vice versa, which is biological means of enhancing wisdom. Is it possible that something like RTMS, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, improve, say, emotional regulation or compassion? And lastly, you know, we live in the age of AI. And the AI is very, very smart. But that's not what we need only. We really need artificial wisdom where the machine, the robots, can learn to be compassionate. So my last two slides. Uh, so I've been talking about wisdom individually, but really there's something at the societal level that is worrisome. You know, I began my talk by showing you how suicides have gone up by 30% in 20 years. Opioid deaths have increased more than 10 folds. Uh, in the last 20 years. We live in a highly stressed, polarized, angry, anxious, and depressed society. Uh, Gallup poll surveys actually clearly show that the level of depression, anxiety, anger has been going up over the last 20 years. And so I call this modern behavioral pandemic of loneliness, suicides, opioid-related deaths of despair. And this occurred before COVID. So, so we need to find vac behavioral vaccines or behavioral antidotes for that. And I suggest that wisdom may be one of those. Compassion, self-reflection, acceptance of diverse perspectives. We need to teach people, starting with kindergarten. Uh, luckily, this is beginning to happen. Um, there are, there's a campaign called Compassionate Communities Campaign. Started in New Zealand, now it is in UK, Australia, uh, and hopefully is coming to the US where the whole community gets together and thinks about how we can help the most disenfranchised segments of our society. So we really need to do things at the societal level and that can be done only through education. So we need to teach our undergraduates, graduates, medical students, businesses, and God forbid, even politicians, to be more kind, compassionate, emotionally regulated, self-reflective and wiser. So it's my last slide. So if we do this, I think we have an opportunity to transform today's lonely, distressed and polarized world into happier, healthier and wiser society. Thank you for your attention. And I'll be happy to take questions. Let me stop share. Thank you so much for that um, wonderful talk. It was completely enlightening and um, I loved it. And we have a number of um, questions for you, but I would like to start out with a question that's relevant to your last slide, actually. Um, a while ago, I had seen, I think it was on PBS, this episode where they had um, started daycare centers at nursing homes. And I think it was originated in like the Netherlands or something. And if you are aware of this, I would love to know what you think. And if you're potentially studying this just in terms of like the transfer of wisdom to the younger population, but also decreasing loneliness in the aged population as well. No, thank you for a great question. This is actually very important. As a geriatric psychiatrist, I believe that one of the best things the society can do is encouraging intergenerational activities. That is critical, uh, critical for both the generation. As I showed you in that experience core study, when older people interacted with younger ones, both generations benefited. And so for nursing home, there is actually, there are some nursing homes that are located close to kindergartens. And th there is one in Tulsa, Oklahoma, for example, which has been there for a long time. And there are descriptions of that, which are actually very touching. So these older people, including those with dementia, they sit glued to the glass in the morning at 6.30 a.m. because 7 a.m. is when the kids start coming. And they, have, they run through that. And then after the, it ends, each older person, I mean, not severely demented person, of course, but those who still have some cognition, they work with the kids and they, sort of read some 
some of their books or do some artwork, it makes the older people so happy. They feel wanted. They feel that they're loved. And they are in, indeed loved by the kid. And of course, for the kids, it is great because they have somebody they can relate to every day. So it is a very mutually beneficial intergenerational activities uh, that now actually it is beginning to happen widely. Uh, for example, some of the senior housing communities, we work with it, many of the retirement communities. There is focus on moving to mixed use facilities where there are younger people and older people rather than only the retired people. Thank you. As a, as a mother of two young children, I think it would be great <laughs> help for us and help for them as well. So I'm just gonna go through the questions and I guess I wanna remind um, the attendees that we're doing a little things differently now, I guess, in Grand Rounds. So if you are a trainee, please write trainee before your question and we're gonna give priority um, to your questions. And so one of the first questions we got, there has been recent discussion of increasing wisdom by use of psychedelic drugs. What are your thoughts on this? That's a very nice question. Um, we just had a talk on psilocybin from uh, Dr. Griffith uh, at Hopkins. And I talked about him exactly the same thing. And it is not clear. Again, I think that there has been no such formal research done. And so he and I agreed that um, we should use some wisdom scale to find out if there is change in the wisdom components as a result of the psychedelics. Um, in some way, there may be some improvement. I think um, clearly the positivity, the positive emotions will increase, maybe more self-reflection, uh, more empathy, compassion. How long it will last, I don't know. And whether there will be some negative effect, that's also possible. So, so this is a great subject for uh, empirical research using, I think the main thing is that we can't to use standard validated scales for wisdom before and after and see if there's a change in scores. Thank you. Um, we have a question from David Lindy. What is, our, what is the role of psychotherapy in enhancing wisdom in older and younger people? Are there studies? Yes, there have been studies. I mean, as I mentioned, these randomized controlled trials, they focused on specific components like uh, empathy, compassion, or emotional regulation, or spirituality. And as I said, half of them actually found that that component improved with um, moderate to large effect size. So these studies are different. Again, they use different strategies. Some were at individual level, some were group therapies. Uh, some of them, actually a number of them include the principles of CBT. Some of them included uh, meditation, mindfulness, some of the relaxation techniques. Uh, role play was important, especially in group uh, therapy sessions. Um, and other strategies like gratitude diary. Now, gratitude diary doesn't mean that you have to write it. You can talk about that. And so in every session, you could talk about things that made you feel grateful, for example. So, so the similar principles apply, but you have to focus on specific components. I think, you know, we are not going to increase wisdom overall just with some single therapy. I don't think that's likely. But if we can focus on some at a time. And so one thing I suggest is people should, you know, they said we publish the scale, San Diego Wisdom Scale, and you can get that online if you open our website. Um, what it does is it gives you scores and usual components of wisdom. You know, all of us are strong in some items and weak in some items. So we need to find out which items you are weak in and then try to improve those. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question that says, what do you think the relationship is between wisdom, executive function, and social cognition? Great question, great question. Um, let me actually broaden the question a bit because it's something often people ask and that what is the relationship of wisdom to intelligence? So the answer to that is wisdom of course, needs some basic intelligence. There is no question about that. 
uh, because if somebody has brain damage, you know, especially affecting prefrontal cortex, then it's not likely that the person would be white. However, there is no correlation between IQ and your score on a wisdom scale. The smartest people are not necessarily wise. The example, some of the mass murderers, some of the terrorists, they are very smart people. They probably have very high IQ. What they lack is not IQ. What they lack is pro-social behavior. They do things to hurt others rather than help others. And the most important component of wisdom, as I said, is empathy and compassion to be helpful to, be helpful to others. So wisdom, and, and that's what applies also to executive function and uh, uh, social intelligence. There is clearly overlap. There's no question about that. You know, I mean, when we, uh, social connections are clearly important. And that's one reason why loneliness and wisdom may be going in the opposite direction. So you do need some social intelligence. You need executive function, of course, I mean, prefrontal cortex being involved, but that's not enough. It's not just cognition, it's also emotions. So in the history of wisdom research, in the beginning, people um, use wisdom and high intelligence as being synonymous. But then slowly people realize that actually emotions are very important. You know, the wisest person in a family may be a grandma who didn't even go to college and not somebody who is MD, PhD, who may be very depressed or maybe antisocial. Thank you, that is great. Um, just a brief question to get out of the way. Will the slides be available? Paul Warren would like to know. Um, obviously it'll be on a YouTube channel, but um, he wants to know if it'll be available. Uh, I'll, I'll be happy to share the slides with you, Kristen or Jeff, and then you can give them to others. Excellent. Um, I am gonna combine two questions from two different people, um, one Dr. Wharton and one from Myrna. And so they write 86% of the US citizens live in cities. Um, isolation is present, church attendance is also down. So maybe more sociology than neurology. And to follow that, Myrna asks, what role do you see for organized religion in disseminating virtues such as wisdom? Thank you, Myrna, great question. Um, so, so there is quite a bit of interest and research in this area. Um, so I mentioned in my slide spirituality as being a component of wisdom. And spirituality, of course, is different from religiosity and atheists can be spiritual. Other than there are some religious extremists who are really not spiritual. So you can also, <laughs> they don't need to go hand in hand. Religiosity, for a long time, studies have shown cross-sectional association between religiosity and greater well-being, more happiness. I mean, clearly there's less stress if you are, if you feel religious, if you believe in God and you have belief in certain practices, if you do that, you'll do well. It, it reduces stress. Uh, and people have said that that is, that may be an artifact or really secondary to the activities that religious people do. For example, they would be going to church or temple or mosque jointly. And when you go to the church, you don't smoke or drink there. Other people who are there also like you. So, so there are other elements that are involved. However, there is some research now increasingly it is showing that religiosity itself may contribute to better health and perhaps longevity. So, I mean, in a way, it is not surprising because I, I do think that that helps. I mean, just like meditation or mindfulness, uh, different people have different ways of reducing their stress. And religiosity is probably an important way of uh, reducing stress. And to that extent, it would contribute to this. And so Manna's point is well taken that that is going down. Uh, and um, so people living in city, there's more social isolation. And that's why, again, we are seeing this increase in suicides and opioid use. And what we need to do is increasing social connections, especially intergenerational social connections, that should be a priority. Thank you very much. Um, so you had touched on AI, but Stephen Heiler would like to know what is the role of technology such as AI in enhancing wisdom? Sure. 
So, so one uh, the clear answer is, you know, what happened during COVID year was that we all switched to telemedicine. Telemedicine was not thought to be actually good for psychiatry for a long time. It was never reimbursed. Things changed dramatically in the last year. And so that's examples of the, how technology helps. Again, you know, talks like this would not be possible if we didn't have Zoom uh, and other technologies. Uh, I think one of the, so we, so we, as, as uh, Jeff mentioned, we have a center on AI in, in partnership with IBM. Uh, and we are studying people in retirement community, uh, older people, uh, and we follow them 24 seven using some uh, variable sensors. And we also do their other cognitive, uh, physical uh, and social assessments. Uh, and I think, that increasingly more and more studies of this kind will be feasible because of technology. You don't need to see people in person um, that we can study tens of thousands of people across the world using technologies like Zoom and variable sensors. Coming to AI though specifically. So, so, if we, so I really think our ability to do large studies is going to increase. Okay, they won't be same as doing studies in person, but still, you can study more people. And there you'll have to use something like machine learning um, to interpret, to, to find the best predictor. And it, machine learning is far from perfect. I mean, it has a lot of limitations like the black box phenomenon. Um, but I do think that there is a potential here for improving AI because, what AI does today is, it, as I said, it is very smart, right? I mean, it can defeat the Jeopardy champion, it can defeat the grand champion in chess and so on. That's not what is needed though. For the society, what is needed is wisdom. So the question is, can we teach the machines to be empathic and compassionate? And not that the machine, robots, the robots won't have soul, they won't have, they won't be like human being, right? But if we can teach our kids empathy and compassion, we should be able to teach robots to detect and increase empathy and compassion. So, and that is what we call artificial wisdom. And that can only happen if the computer scientists and engineers work with neuroscientists, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, and ethicists and philosophers. Thank you. We have some more questions, but Dr. Lieberman has a question first, so um, he's going to ask you his question directly. <laughs> okay, so Dilip, I, I, I've got three quick questions. Um, uh, we have a youth-oriented culture. Uh, is that sort of work against the acquisition of wisdom in any any way? And then uh, related to that, um, is, is wisdom age-dependent? In other words, uh, you you sometimes you hear the expression, oh, he's you know, he was um, wise before his years, or he was, you know, he was born an old, old, old man or old woman or so forth and so on. Well, again, great questions, great questions. So, um, yeah, we have become a use focused culture. There's no question. I mean, there is so much emphasis on materialistic uh, accomplishments, how rich we are and then, right. And that really hurts us because that's a temporary pleasure that we get. So it is like being on a hedonic treadmill. Um, we will never be happy because we will keep on wanting more and more. Instead of that, if so, so that's the difference between hedonic well being and eudaimonic well being. Eudaimonic well being is where you think about the community, society as a whole. You think about others, helping others as your goal and not just helping yourself becoming rich. So 100% well taken. Age also, thank you for asking that question. Actually, I sure I alluded to that earlier. But so I talked about how wisdom increases with aging. However, there is no one-to-one -one relationship between age and wisdom. There are some older people who are very unwise. And we see that uh, in politics and businesses, <laughs> among others. And on the other hand, there are young people who are very wise. Uh, and that's where actually the probably the trait thing comes into play. There are, I mean, I have seen even four or five year old kids who are so compassionate, empathic, uh, 
they, they run through temper tantrum. They help their siblings. They help other kids. They take the leadership role. And so they're born that way. And of course, they if the parents encourage, they'll continue. So wisdom is not necessarily associated with aging, which means that anybody can actually become wiser than what they are. Well, I mean, there was the Ericksonian stages of life, you know, where generativity was something that came later. He was suggesting that there were sort of stages that, I guess, you know, facilitated the, the greater capacity to acquire wisdom as opposed to, you know, resist it or not be able to acquire it. Well, I, I think the stages help to some extent in the sense one thing that definitely happens with age is experience. Five-year-old, 25-year-old is not going to have the experience that a 65-year-old had. And the experience teaches us. Again, it depends on us. I mean, whether we learn from experience or not, that's up to us. But if you, if you don't have the experience, clearly you don't have the advantage of learning from that, right? So there's no question that age helps with experience. However, that's not enough. So the wisdom, that wisdom level would be different. So five-year-old wise kid cannot be same as the 65 year old wise person because they have, right? Uh, so clearly there are stages that are important, but I don't think the stages are that hard biologically determined. And I do think that things have changed so much in the last 20 years with the growth of technology that the old stages may not apply today. I mean, for the first time in history, first time in the human history, children who are three, four, five years old, no more than their parent, let alone grandparent, in something, i.e. technology. I mean, I have seen parents go to their five, six, seven year olds to fix the problems with the iPhone. <laughs> this, this never happened in the entire history because always the parent, because right in the agricultural world, for example, or in business world, whatever it is, the parents always knew so much more. And that's why you need, now <laughs> it is actually, truly intergenerational mentoring that the kids are teaching us. Well, <laughs> we teach them something else. So, so Erickson is not, not the same as Piaget. <laughs> right, right, well said. <laughs> okay, we have some more questions that we'll try to get through in five minutes. Um, Devanon said, thank you for another outstanding lecture. It gets better every time that you're at Columbia. Um, you did not mention the survival effect impacting um, increasing wisdom with age. People who have committed suicide or died from complications of substance abuse um, and other causes do not survive to old age. So could you comment on that? Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much. Actually, no, this is a great point. And actually, yes, I should have mentioned that. It, there's no question about that. I mean, uh, as genetic psychiatrists, we know that, that when we study older people, that's an inherently biased group of people, people who have survived to that age. And clearly these are people who have more resilience, not only psychologically, but biologically also. Uh, clearly that's why uh, many other people didn't make it. And also partly because of things like suicides and opioid use related deaths that uh, kill uh, people who didn't have enough wisdom to spot, right? So 100% correct, your point is very well taken. However, there are some longitudinal studies. When you follow people, you see that those components actually increase in them. Um, so for example, in, even in schizophrenia, uh, we found that as you follow these people, again, that's a survivor, no question, just survivor bias, people who live to age uh, 60 or so. But then slowly they start handling their symptoms better. From experience, they learn not to stop medications, uh, not to smoke uh, as much as they used to. So, so definitely there is a cohort bias, survivor bias, but there is also effect of aging and experience. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question uh, again, I think from Dr. Wharton. Please comment on Sherry Turkle's 2011 book on Alone Together, um, expecting more from technology and less from each other, if you are aware of that book. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I have not read that book. Uh, but what you're talking about is that we depend 
more on technology rather than on, i think that is that is indeed true unfortunately especially for younger people that there is more and more connections with one another through social media rather than in person and that's why it is something i you know talk about wisdom and aging it this affects younger people more than older people i mean as i showed you the covid during covid younger people did the worst where in spite of best physical health and in spite of all technology being there and that shows how technology can't really help you what you need a real connection and there are actually other studies that have shown that younger people today are much worse off than younger people were 30 years ago but older people today are much better off than older people were 30 years ago and part of that is social because of medicare social security and you know our um, paying attention to uh, disability etc we have improved in taking care of older people not so much the younger people well dilip does this mean that uh, telemedicine or telecommuting is going to be disadvantageous well i mean yes and no like everything i mean the technology has been very helpful in many ways so when i criticize technology or social media that's not uh, i think the way it is overused is the problem so where the pro- i think facebook would be great for older people because that's how they you know physically they have to be isolated because they are not surrounded by others unlike younger people but if they connect with people across the world who have the same condition or that'll be great for them so it's like anything you know the social media are not bad at all but if they're used badly and that's a problem that overuse and abuse is a problem it's not the technology itself Okay, um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, this is from Harold Pincus. Are there evidence-based strategies for interventions for lonely older people who avoid so, uh, social interaction because of perceived shame of their appearance, behavior, eating, feeding, et cetera? Oh, thank you, Harold. Uh, again, a very nice question. So th- there is quite a bit of literature, a growing literature on interventions for loneliness in general. Uh, and there are different psychosocial uh, interventions that have been that are being tried uh, even physical activity helps uh, with loneliness uh, but the specific subgroup that you are mentioning no i don't think there is any randomized controlled trial in that group and of course the interventions for loneliness will have to be ultimately personalized because different people do differ in what is causing loneliness and what is feasible for them uh, right so now clearly we do need uh, i think one thing is we need to motivate people to change and that's one of the issues with not just loneliness with wisdom you know so why why don't we do this for everybody well if <laughs> motivation is the main thing that comes in the way if we want to be better we can be better but if we don't want to change we can't change and you know in psychiatry we are all used to this you know people with schizophrenia people with dementia bipolar seriously mentally i mean the, the, the often the difficulties in convincing people that they need treatment well i think that is probably all we have time for today unless dr lieberman has any other questions but thank you again for a absolutely wonderful talk and it was an honor to hear you speak so thank you thank you thank you it's really my honor to come and speak at columbia this is this is hands down one of the finest uh, psychiatry departments in the world and it's and as you could see from the questions and comments it's a group of brilliant people and nice people and good friends